take the effort of the newly appointed chief medical examiner, Dr. Harrison Martland, with the help of Von Sahaki to help prove Hoffman's theory. On June 7th, the first male employee of USRC, Dr. Edwin LeMann. Oh, stupid man. <laughs> who had scoffed at the drinkers during their study. It was the first case brought to Dr. Martland's attention. LeMann's death certificate said pernicious anemia. He was 36 and had died after only a few weeks of illness, much too quickly for a normal case of anemia. Martland was called in to conduct an autopsy. Martland suspected radium poisoning, but special tests would have to be administered. Together with Von Sahaki, they reduced LeMann's bones to ashes, then tested the ash with an instrument called an electrometer. They made medical history by positively measuring radioactivity in a human body for the first time. As they were, Sahaki and the dentist, Dr. Nakneff, appealed to Martland to aid the dial painters. By mid-June, Marguerite's palate had so eroded that it opened into her nasal passages. At her hospital bedside was her ever faithful sister, Sarah. Sarah had been with USRC since the beginning. She was actually the person who got Marguerite a position with the company. She was older than most of the women who worked at the studio. She was 28 in 1917, but now she was a matronly 36. She walked with an obvious limp and used a cane. She'd been losing weight and assumed it was due to worry for her sister and her 14-year-old daughter. She had noticed that she was bruising easily. At least the black and blue spots all over her body appeared to be bruises. Her teeth ached and her gums bled constantly. Dr. Mertlin wanted to test Marguerite, but when he got there, he observed Sarah was not doing well. He ran tests on Sarah and discovered that she was severely anemic. It's almost as though Sarah allowed the truth to sink in after that, and she went from being bad to worse very quickly. The two sisters were soon sharing a hospital room. Sarah declined even further and rapidly. Her face swelled up and her glands were hot and tender. She ran a regular temperature between 102 to nearly 106 degrees. She had marked lesions in her mouth. She was found to be incredibly toxic. In order for Martland to test the women further, he had to invent new tests to perform on living humans as the only test currently known required him to burn the suspected radioactive bones to ash. Not prepared to kill the women, even for science, Von Sahaki and Martland put their heads together. The pair devised two methods. A gamma ray test, which involved sitting the patient before an electroscope to read the gamma radiation coming from the skeleton, and an expired air method. As radium decays into the gas radon, they figured the toxic gas might be expelled from the women as they breathed out. The test would require the patient to blow through a series of bottles in an electroscope so that the amount of radon could be measured. When the doctors got to the hospital expecting to test Marguerite, they realized just how much Sarah had declined in her health, and they chose to test her first. The first test with the electrometer proved her body was leaking radium. Next came the breath test. Sarah was so ill she had difficulty completing the test, but in the end the results indicated she had three times the amount of radium they expected to find. With her testing concluded, the doctors left her alone. Two days later, she would be dead, only one week after being admitted to a hospital. Martland spoke to the media on the day Sarah died, choosing his words wisely, speaking only of theory and suspicion, but confirming that initial results were indeed leaning towards radium poisoning, and commenting how it was so insidious and took so long long to manifest that it was likely the poisoning had been going on for quite some time all over the country. But he wouldn't say definitively until he could prove it scientifically. During Sarah's autopsy, Martlin discovered her left leg was four centimeters shorter than her right. Her bone marrow was dark red instead of a healthy, fatty yellow. He tested everything. Her liver, her spleen, her bones, her legs, her jaw, they were all radioactive. He also discovered while the amounts of radium ingested were low by consideration, it didn't matter. What mattered was that in her bones, the radium was attacking her from inside, very marrow. The radium was affecting each woman differently, which is why no connections were being made. While it aimed for the bones, it did seem to care which bones. In some, like Sarah, the knee. In others, the hip and Grace Fryer, the back. Martland's final test was to place dental films over Sarah's bones. Within 60 hours, the film had developed a soft, eerie fog. Martland understood radium had a half-life of 1,600 years. And while Sarah was dead, her bones would continue to beam radiation for centuries. He also knew that radium was indestructible and there was no way to remove it from bone. Radium poisoning was incurable. With the announcement of Sarah's death and reports making the news, Catherine Schaub, 
Grace Fryer, and several others made appointments with Dr. Martland for his new testing. They all tested positive for radioactive substances. They now had legal evidence for a lawsuit, but they still faced the five-month statute of limitations in New Jersey. Lawyer after lawyer told the woman the same thing, that despite a positive diagnosis of radium poisoning, that because they hadn't been ill and weren't diagnosed within the two years of their leaving the company, they had no legal grounds. Meanwhile, Marguerite Carlaw still struggled to stay alive. Her blood was almost white, and her blood count was only 20% when a normal reading would be 100. X-rays showed that radium had eaten away her lower jaw to a stump. In December of 1925, even though Marguerite Carla contracted pneumonia, she spent Christmas at home with her mom and dad and her niece, Sarah's daughter. And in the early morning hours on Boxing Day, at the age of 24, she passed away. Now, more women were coming forward. Molly Maggia's two sisters who had worked with her at the studio, Kinta McDonald, and Albina Larisse. Kinta had been dealing with terrible aching joints for several years, and doctors had put her in a full body cast to attempt. Honestly, I don't know what they were attempting. I don't know what the point of putting somebody in a full body cast is. Compression? I don't. Not a doctor. Albina had just given birth to a stillborn baby after four years of trying to get pregnant, but now two weeks after the delivery, severe pain appeared in her limbs and her left leg began to shorten. So just like Kinta, earlier in the year, the doctors popped her in a full body cast for four months. Down the hospital from Albina was another dial painter, Edna Hussman. She had been seeing the doctors since September of 1925 for rheumatism, but nothing helped. Her newest doctor, Dr. Humphreys, noted she walked with a defined lip and upon measuring, discovered her leg was one inch shorter than her right, so he x-rayed it. Looking at the images, he realized her leg was broken, a spontaneous fracture of the neck of the femur from a stumble she had had. Dr. Humphrey stated that while odd and clearly uncomfortable, it had nothing whatsoever to do with radiation poisoning. Dr. Humphreys put her in a plaster cast for a full year. For a full year and that was that. By spring of 1926, the only movement any of the women were seeing legally was a labor law that had been put into place recognizing radium necrosis as a compensable disease. However, the bill could not be applied retroactively, so no one injured before 1926 could claim it. Also, it only applied to necrosis of the jaw, so the anemia, the leg and back issues, even the loosening of the teeth the women were suffering from wouldn't be covered. Plus, it was attached to the existing laws, so they still had the five month limitation to deal with. Grace Fryer, despite the continuous removal of teeth from her mouth and her endlessly aching back, continued to look for a lawyer. The other women seemed to have given up, and honestly who can blame them? A USRC payroll doctor, Dr. Flynn, though no one knew he was in their pocket, while acknowledging to other medical peers that the ladies' issues were likely radium related, to their faces he towed the company line. But it was a newspaper article that caught Grace's attention. One morning, a small buried piece that announced USRC had settled out of court the suits of Marguerite Carla, her sister Sarah, and Hazel Cuser. It wouldn't be until May of 1927 that Grace managed to find a lawyer to take the case. By this time her spine was disintegrating and being crushed by its own weight. She was forced to wear a steel back brace and a brace on her foot as the bones had broken and refused to heal. And of course the ever-present ache in her jaw. Raymond Barry, their new lawyer, was just 30 years old and likely only a few years out of Yale when he met Grace. He listened to Grace's statement and and a few days later, feeling optimistic herself, Catherine Schaub also met him. Barry, in turn, spoke with Dr. Martland, and upon reviewing the two women's statements, he decided to take the case. Barry had a different interpretation of the statute of limitations. The women could not have brought suit against the company until they were sure the company was to blame, as USRC had actively conducted a campaign of misinformation to mislead the girls and suppress the drinker report, it should not be allowed to rely upon the delay they themselves created. As the women were only formally diagnosed in July of 1925, the countdown could only have begun then. They were still just within the two-year limit. On May 18, 1927, Raymond Berry filed a formal complaint on behalf of Grace and Catherine against the Radium firm. Grace would be fighting first for $250,000, $3.4 million. Give it to him, Grace! Once the newspapers got wind of the story, the other women contacted Barry. Kinta and Albina joined the suit, and Barry very smartly added their husbands to the names of plaintiffs. Edna Hussman, who had been living in a cast for a year, once released, found her left leg to now be three inches shorter than her right, and her right shoulder completely locked up so she couldn't use her arm. <laughs> 
great. Recent blood tests also showed she was desperately anemic. And one night, groping for her medicine in the dark, she caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror. While it had been years since working at the studio, her mirrored image glowed in the darkness of her bedroom. She and her husband would join the lawsuit in June. Remember good old comedy doc Flynn? Yeah. He was getting around to all the watch painting factories. The Waterbury Clock Company in particular was keen to keep the girls in the dark. So when the girls began getting sick, Flynn would convince them that it wasn't a big deal and then Waterbury would settle out of court. They paid out anywhere from the insultingly low $43.75, $600, to $5,600 which is $75,000 today, depending on the complaints and severity of cases. So no legal battles had been brought to either workman's comp or through the legal system. Everything was settled out of court. Flynn had managed to convince most of the women that they were in better health than he was through examinations. He'd been taking blood and giving x-rays, arranging medical treatment, and writing to women on College of Physicians and Surgeons letterhead. It would seem, however, the good doctor wasn't an MD. No, 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 no. He had a degree in philosophy. <laughs> Die in a fire. Because of Dr. Flynn's meddling on behalf of the radium companies, Barry was unable to find more women who were suffering the same as these five were. Never mind Marguerite, Sarah, and Hazel who were already dead and USRC settled their cases, which clearly proved culpability, but there was also Molly. Ah. But Molly died of the scandal of syphilis, and poor Della had tuberculosis, Helen Quinlan, oh well, she had angina, and poor Irene Rudolph and Francis, well, granted. They had necrosis of the jaw, but <laughs> you can't prove radium caused it. It's so good for you. Even out in Illinois, at the Radium Dollar Company, there was only one odd case, and that had nothing to do with radium. Right? Ella Cruz, 24, had been working for the company for four years and recently started to feel tired and worn out. It's the same old song. She went to see a doctor about a toothache several months back and the dentist pulled it, but just like her co-workers, Peg, and a couple others, it wasn't healing. She also had painful rheumatism in her fingers and her knuckles, and recently her legs. Most odd was a strange hard ridge that had developed under her chin. She was having small breakouts of pimples on her usually clear skin. She was feeling so tired that she went home early from work on Friday, August 26th. She had picked at the pimple and it was swelling up a bit and painful and she was just so tired. The next day, her mother took her to the doctor. The pimple had swollen further and her mother was worried about it. Ella spent the weekend at home in bed mostly and didn't go to work on Monday. On Tuesday, August 30th, her mother called for a physician to see to the increasingly large swelling on her daughter's face. The doctor opened it to drain but nothing came out. The pimple just kept painfully swelling and she had developed a fever. It was clearly some sort of infection. On August 31st, the doctor admitted her to the hospital. Trust me. This pimple is not filled with spiders. <laughs> By September 4th, Ella Cruz was dead. Within 10 days, she was dead. It's wild. Her pimple had swollen to take over her face and septic poisoning had set in. Her face and head turned black. Her death certificate said streptococcic poisoning. Contributory cause? Infected face. All this from a pimple. So as you see, as far as the law and medicine was concerned, the New Jersey women were anomalies. Barry knew the power of the press, and so he involved a personal friend of his, Walter Lippmann, who would be deemed as one of the most influential journalists of the 20th century, and the most powerful newspaper in America at the time, the world. Lippmann wrote about the attempted legal trickery of the corporation, calling out their attempt at hiding behind the statute of the five-month limitation. Intolerable and despicable, it is scarcely thinkable that the court will not agree with the counsel for the complainant. He was right. The court didn't agree with the company, but they also weren't sure about Barry's interpretation of the law, so first he had to defend that before the women could begin their case. The first trial was set for January 12th, 1928. Given the money and the resources that USRC had and the twisting trickery they employed to keep the idea that radium was safe, Barry knew he had to somehow prove beyond doubt or opinion that the women were laced with radium. Any exams done on the women could be refuted by any company doctor. If you remember, the only way to extract radium from the bones was to reduce the bones to ash. 
trash. For this, they needed Molly Magia, Albina and Kinta's sister, who had died of syphilis. On October 15th, 1927, they exhumed Molly Magia. Pulling her to the surface, the outer box and her casket were in such terrible condition that they easily just came apart. And despite the daylight, a glow was observed emanating from her coffin. Once the lid was open, they observed deposits of luminescent radium compounds surrounding her well-preserved body. They performed all the usual tasks of an autopsy, plus the irregular methods that they had employed on Edwin LeMann. Oh, stupid man. <laughs> And sisters Marguerite and Sarah, reducing some bones to ash for testing and wrapping others in x-ray films. As expected by Dr. Marlin, her bones made white pictures on the dark film. Each and every portion of tissue and bone tested gave evidence of radioactivity. The doctors concluded, and there was no evidence of disease, particularly no evidence of syphilis. Molly's autopsy was reported in newspapers, and the fight for justice was becoming front page news. Because of this, another woman now came forward. Ella Eckert, who had worked with Molly and all the girls, met with Barry. She appeared in better health than the other women, but admitted she had spent several hundred dollars on x-rays and blood tests, medicine and medical attention. She'd had a fall at work the year before and had been forced to give up her job as her shoulder never healed. Barry's focus was on the upcoming trials and defending his client's claim to legal action. Whether he agreed to take on Ella's case is unknown, but on December 13th, 1927, Ella died. She'd had an operation on her shoulder earlier that day, and when the doctors cut her open, they observed a growth of considerable size that had permeated the entire shoulder region. Instead of attacking her jaw or gnawing away at her bones from the inside like the other women, the radiation had developed a new way to kill. It was called a sarcoma. Ella was the first known dial painter to die from this, but boy, she wouldn't be the last. The first trial began in January 1928. Barry had achieved a heck of a lineup to defend the women. He'd had to subpoena Dr. Drinker, but eventually everyone came willingly, even Dr. Markland and Von Sahaki. And while the USRC lawyers literally, literally objected at every turn, the judge was clearly sympathetic to the women. Oh, very old. Several times stepped in to aid Barry around sustained objection, and more than once essentially told the USRC lawyer to sit down. Barry flew through his witnesses, one expert after the other, and the USRC lawyers could only try to twist their words and confuse them. Which happened, but Judge Bax was there to help untwist. The surprise upset came when the trial resumed in April of that year and Sabin von Sohaki took the stand. He had been fired or voted out or whatever it is that companies do in a takeover years ago, and he had willingly aided Dr. Martland in creating and developing the tests necessary to determine radioactivity in the human body. And when Grace was being examined, a moment she remembered of one day in the studio years ago when he happened to glance at her on his way through the offices as she placed the brush in her mouth. He looked at her and said, don't do that, it'll make you sick. She asked him why he didn't do more, and his lame response at the time was simply that it wasn't in his jurisdiction. Despite all of this, when he was called to the stand, he flat out refused he ever said any of it. That the practice of lip pointing was unusual, and if he had said anything of the sort, it certainly had nothing to do with radiation and everything to do with the practice being unsanitary. You think he was paid off? Don't worry, he gets his in the end. It wasn't even a full year later when he died of aplastic anemia, which by all accounts is a very painful way to go. Karma! The women, particularly Grace and Barry, were gobsmacked. Barry called him a hostile witness and immediately called on Grace to refute his testimony. But the USRC lawyer objected to her evidence, and Judge Bax grudgingly was forced to sustain, commenting, These rules of evidence have been invented to prevent people from telling the truth. It was April 27th, 1928, when Raymond Barry rested his case. Now, it was up to USRC to put their version on the stand. Just as Judge Bax was to set a date, the USRC lawyer requested an off-the-record discussion. And upon completion, the judge announced the hearing was adjourned until September 24th, five months away. Barry immediately went to work, looking for lawyers willing to switch court dates. He found a pair with a date in May. Judge Bax agreed immediately for the date change, but USRC stalled, saying it would be impossible for them to proceed in May. Their experts were going abroad for several months and wouldn't be back until the end of summer. Maybe I'm cynical, but it's the world we live in. There is no way that that wasn't a deliberate delay, hoping that the women would be dead before a verdict could be reached. But Barry was worth 
every penny coming to him. It must have been incredibly difficult for the women to hear, but he found four different doctors unrelated to the case to sign sworn statements that these girls, girls, are all becoming progressively worse. It is very possible that all or some of these five girls may be dead by September 1928. It did the trick. The media was up in arms. Walter Lippmann of the world, We confidently assert that this is one of the most damnable travesties of justice that has ever come to our attention. The editorial sparked support across the nation. Reporters, politicians, and the public yelled for justice on behalf of the women. Barry took advantage once again and set up interviews for the women who insisted the reporters write the truth of what was happening to them. Albina's two dead babies and the forced medical abortion of a third. Kinta having to be carried to hospital appointments and Edna's crossed legs frozen in position. Catherine Schaub said in one interview, don't think I'm crying because I'm downhearted. It's because my hip hurts so. Sometimes it seems as though a knife is boring into my side. The tragedy and pain were what captivated the public. The momentum of the case was definitely in the women's favor. No matter the response of the radium company, the trial was scheduled to go ahead at the end of May 1928. It was May 23rd when Barry met with his old boss, Judge William Clark, to discuss Clark's suggestion of settling the suits out of court. Clark had also met with the USRC legal team. Barry had no doubt that he and the women could and would win this trial and then the second, but it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of how long. USRC had so far been doing everything and would continue to do everything in their power to delay, hoping that the women would die before a verdict could be reached. In the interest of the dying women, Barry chose to see what results could be achieved through mediation. And though the case was not within his jurisdiction, Judge Clark was the unofficial mediator. Just because I am a federal judge, does that mean I cannot have a heart? Oh, gets you right here. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me again. May 31st, the USRC held a board meeting to discuss possible terms of a settlement. Vice President Barker now declared, No, the directors wanted to do what was fair. However, we absolutely deny any liability. Hmm. By settling out of court, all the bad press would essentially go away. Any future battles wouldn't be as likely to kick up as much publicity as this case had. It was in USRC's best interest to settle. The first and frankly insulting offer from USRC was outrageous, and the women rightly turned it down. USRC was offering $10,000 each, approximately 138000 today. But all medical bills and the cost of litigation would be deducted from that, leaving the women with very little for future hospital visits or to help their families after they had died. Oh, see, now that pisses me off. Before you come back here with another lame-ass offer, I want you to think real hard about what your spine is worth, Mr. Walker, or what you might expect someone to pay you for your uterus, Miss Sanchez. Then you take out your calculator and you multiply that number by 100. Anything less than that is a waste of our time. Barry countered with 15000 as a cash lump sum for each woman, a $600 pension a year for life. The company would cover the cost of all past and future medical bills, as well as the court costs. USRC had the weekend to think over it. June 4th, 1928. The lawyers met at 10 a.m. and by 10.45 the company men were leaving to draft up the formal terms of settlement. Each woman would get a $10,000 lump sum, but all past and future medical costs would be covered, the court costs would be covered, and they would get a yearly pension of $600 for life. But USRC needed something in return. The settlement stated that the company admitted no guilt and the claims of the plaintiffs, even if well-founded, are barred by the statute of limitation. The company also insisted that a committee of three doctors be set up to examine the girls regularly. One appointed by the women, one by the company, and the third would be mutually agreed upon. This was to ensure that should any two of the doctors find that the women were no longer suffering from radium, that the payments would cease. <laughs> Lol. Barry knew right away that the company clearly intended to find some way to avoid paying the women, but for now, they would get the desperate financial help they needed. All in all, they saw it as a win. Now, here is where the story usually ends. The women settle out of court get some of the money they're owed, and eventually they die. It's sad, but they brought changes to the workforce that were desperately needed, and their deaths were not in vain. Except it's not the end. And sure, they got some money, but by selling out of court, USRC was never officially found guilty. Sure, they had bad press, but they moved past it. And yes, they stopped the practice of lip pointing. But the women were still there, in the studios, using radium-laced paint to paint the dials. Bare hands covered in radioactive paint. The radioactive dust covering them from head to toe. They breathed it in and they ate their lunches at their desks. Anytime they spoke and opened their mouths, they would ingest the material in even more minute amounts than the lip pointing gals. But 
as Dr. Martland discovered, it didn't matter how much you ingested. Once you ingested it, it found its way to your bones. And it wasn't a matter of if, but when. Oh, and USRC did a beautiful job of tying up the best chance any future dial painters had of their day in court. Barry could no longer take cases or even assist or consult in someone else's case if it had anything to do with USRC. That was the only way that one of his other plaintiffs would get their money. He was literally Kerrigan. They took him out at the kneecaps figuratively speaking. But surely the newspapers and public outcry, that would have been enough to make them stop using radium, right? Three days following the announcement of the New Jersey settlement, a full-page ad was placed by the Radium Dial Company in Illinois, dating how they ran frequent medical exams on the women, how the trouble in the New Jersey studio was due to the fact that they used the bad radium. But here in Illinois, they used the good radium. And the bad radium was known to have all the kinds of nasty side effects. But no, 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 not the good radium. The whole town believed it. After all, painting radium dials was one of Ottawa's leading industries. It would have been terrible for everyone to lose that business. USRC having benched Barry was now able to run up the clock on any further lawsuits. The stock market crash of 29 and subsequent depression had little to no effect at all. In fact, the desire for radium continued and USRC was there to fulfill the orders and once the US joined the fight in World War II, they increased their personnel by 1600%. For the women in Ottawa, Illinois, it wouldn't be until 1937 that five former dial painters, Catherine Wolf Donahue, Charlotte Nevins Purcell, Pearl Payne, Olive West Witt, and Marie Becker Rossiter formed the Society of the Living Dead, whereby those of which there must be thousands could band together, secure legal aid, and in general use our organized presence to simplify, promote, and approve the laws relative to those who are maimed due to occupational hazards. They found a lawyer to take their case and file suit before the Illinois Industrial Commission. By this point, though, Radium Dial had closed up shop and seemingly disappeared. A $10,000 bond had been posted with the IIC when Radium Dial closed. They couldn't find insurance to cover the cost of indemnifying the company against employee lawsuits, so that's what they did. And the women were expected to split that. Neat. Well, one of their former presidents, Joseph Kelly, had set up his own radium painting business in Ottawa, practically across the street from where Radium Dial used to be. Their complaint was with Radium Dial and not with Joseph Kelly. Luckily though, just as with the women in New Jersey, they had the media on their side and a reporter discovered Radium Dial's new headquarters. It would take a year, but in the spring of 1938, the IIC ruled in favor of the women, but Radium Dial's lawyers appealed and appealed again and again and again, making its way slowly to the Supreme Court. October 23rd, 1939, the court decided not to hear the appeal and the lower ruling was upheld. When it was all said and done, the case had been won eight times before Radium Dial was finally forced to pay. But wait, there's more! This still isn't the end of the story. Radium Dial in Ottawa had been running out of an old high school. When they packed up and skipped town, a meat locker company took up residence. Workers began dying and people who ate the meat developed cancer. In 1968, the city knocked down the building and spread the waste around the town, using it as landfill near a school field. Later studies would show an above average cancer rate across town. Pets and wildlife died young and often with tumors. In 1978, Joseph Kelly's luminous processes was still painted dials. 1978. They weren't using the lip pointed technique, mind you, but with very few other safety precautions. And the women were still getting sick, breast cancer mostly. Some saw the loosening of teeth and changes in their blood. As of 2015, the EPA was still working to clean up Ottawa, Illinois. Thanks, though, to the women who came before, safety measures were put in place, and it was now one of the most feared occupations. Kinta died of a sarcoma on her hip after sinking into a coma on December 7th, 1929. Grace died October 27th, 1933. Her death certificate said radium sarcoma, industrial poisoning. Edna died of a sarcoma of the femur on March 30th, 1939. Albina passed away November 18th, 1946, of a leg sarcoma. The case of the Radium Ghost Girls or Society of the Living Dead holds an important place in history for the labor rights movement. The right of the individual worker to sue for damages from corporations due to labor abuse was established as a result of the Radium Girls cases. Their lawsuit was a factor in the establishment of occupational disease labor law. The Center for Human Radiobiology was established in 1968. Its primary purpose was providing medical examinations of living dial painters. It also focused on collecting tissue samples and information from the surviving dial painters. When the project ended in 1993, detailed information of some 2,000 
2,000 plus cases had been collected. Hello! This is my first episode and I'm not really sure what I'm going to be about yet. This is not going to be a regular format style for me, I think. It was a story I wanted to share and I thought Halloween would be perfect for it. Spoopy. It's a little bit lengthy and um... Come here! Oh, I hear you. So does everybody else. Yeah, come here! Come here! I'm coming to get you! Okay. So grumpy. Why are you so grumpy? And she's off. Anyway, I hope you find this as fascinating as I did, and I hope you stick around to see what else I come up with. I've got some sewing projects on the way, I'm knitting something, um, some embroidery, I've got a really big project on the horizon. Yeah, so if you want to follow along and see what I'm coming up with, hit the subscribe button and the bell button so you get notified whenever I drop something new. Don't have a schedule yet, this is my first one. Who knows what's gonna happen? Thumbs up, always appreciated, I guess. I don't know. I'm new. I don't know what I'm asking you to do. Awkward! Thumbs up and um, leave comments in the comment section. Uh, if there's a story you'd like me to look into or, you know, if you uh, just want to say hi, I hope I will be seeing you again on this channel. I guess I've made a channel. Let's, let's see what happens. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know how else to sign off. Have a really wonderful haunting season. I guess it's not really a season now that it's over though. Have a really great Halloween. All right. Mwah. Bye. I think that's it.